Today's reading is taken from Exodus 3, verses 1 to 15. Moses at the burning bush. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard them cry their account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The divine name revealed. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask him, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus shall you say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. So ends the reading.
as the choir goes back into the choir loft, um, I just want to invite us. We didn't have a question at the beginning of our service, and um, we uh, traditionally have a question at the beginning just to get to know one another a little bit and to remember that we are not alone in this community. Um, last night, uh, Dr. Henshaw mentioned the um, pandemic of thinking that we are here alone, <laughs> um, that we uh, operate as solo people. And um, one of the gifts of the church is to rem remember that we are not alone, that we are in community together. And so I will invite us um, just to turn to somebody next to you. If nobody's next to you and you don't feel like moving anywhere, that's okay too. You can just take this on as um, pondering by yourself. But hopefully you'll um, find somebody that you can discuss this question with. And the question is this. Uh, the earth at this time is renewing, it's springtime, it's changing, and um, I always find that that's most dramatic in the spring. I don't know if you do as well. But so the question I have for you today is, what did you notice this week? What did you notice this week? It could be something springing up out of the ground, it could be um, you notice a certain, like a, a person walking by you, whatever it is, it's a broad topic. So I'll just invite just a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to somebody nearby and to uh, talk about the question, what did you notice this week? Just uh, three minutes, okay, promise. Okay, I don't know if that was three minutes or not, but I'll invite us to come back together. In the group I was in, we were talking about how pops of color have shown up all over the place, and it's like the Wizard of Oz when technicolor happens. Let us pray. God of burning bushes and fields, God of backyards and open spaces, God of Mosaic, Isaac, Miriam, and Sarah, God of each of us, speak to our hearts and minds today. Amen. I'm going to take one second and just move this. Uh, there's, there's a little thing to stand on here, and I don't think I need it today. Feeling taller. There we go. <laughs> At this time of the year, as the days begin earlier and stretch longer into the evening, I find that I start paying attention to the outdoors with lots of expectation. I find myself lingering in my backyard when I'm trying to uh, corral my dog back inside, and I notice things in a way that I don't seem to do during the winter. I see the first signs of new growth happening on trees and plants. And I remember once again how much I like to be in the backyard. I also notice that there's a lot of work to do to make it a nice place to sit. My, my mind begins to wander and it starts making lists of things to do. Uncover the furniture, sweep things off, plant some flowers. My backyard is more of a traditional settler yard with a fence and a patio and a small garden. But backyard can mean lots of different things. Maybe it's an enclosed place uh, with a manicured lawn and an intentionally placed plants and shrubs. 
Or maybe backyard is a patio or a balcony with space for a chair and maybe a potted plant or two. Maybe your definition of backyard is even broader. Maybe you think of your backyard as a park close to where you live, or the Rocky Mountains, or even the whole wide world. In our story today, we find Moses in a field, his backyard, and he's tending to his father-in-law's sheep. The field isn't much. It's not wooded or lush, just a deserty type place with small shrubs, a place where the family sheep get to live and graze. I imagine that tending sheep out in the middle of a desert field in ancient times wasn't really that great. It would have been hours and days of seeing no one, no cafes to sit and linger, no friends to chat with, no books to read. But on this particular day, something extraordinary happens. In the distance, Moses sees smoke on the horizon I imagine he thinks he's seeing things, maybe a mirage, or maybe he thinks he's had too much sun. But curiosity leads him over to the smoke, and there he finds a bush engulfed in flames, but not burned by the fire. As he is trying to figure out what the heck is going on, a voice speaks to him, Moses, take off your shoes. The ground you are standing on is holy. This desolate field, this average desert backyard, is holy ground. I'm going to assume that not many of us have had this kind of moment where God is spoke, um, speaks to us through a burning bush. But maybe you've had another experience that just as plainly told you that a particular place was sacred. Maybe you've had that experience canoeing in a remote river or walking with a child in your neighborhood or encountering someone who made you feel this is a sacred space. I am standing on holy ground. One of those places for me is a place nestled in the Angeles Crest Forest just above Pasadena, California. It's a camp that I used to go to um, that I spent a week every summer during my junior high and high school days. And in that place, my faith was nurtured and developed. It is indeed holy ground for me. I think about Chief John Snow and, and how he recounts the sacred place of the mountains in and around Banff and Canmore in his book, The Mountains Are Our Sacred Places. I spoke to a person this week who was recounting their days as a child swimming in a particular place with their family, holy ground. Burning bush or not, we can hear the sacred invitation, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. The beauty of our biblical story is that God appears in an average everyday place. Moses is not expecting to find the sacred in a bush in the desert on that particular day, but that is exactly where the sacred shows up. God shows up in our average days and in our average places, even in our backyards. The backyard then becomes a metaphor for all of creation. The sacred presence in a field in ancient Egypt in a suburban yard with patio and pool, on a downtown balcony, on a trail in the mountains, even on the sidewalks of downtown Calgary. Over the past few months, I've been reading the book, The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year by Margaret Wrinkle. On her website, she describes the book as, quote, a literary devotional 52 chapters that follow the creatures and plants in her backyard over the course of a year. 
I found it's the perfect book to pick up just for a few minutes, to read a short chapter and then come back the next day. And what I'm finding is the gift of this book is that Wrinkle invites us to notice the sacred that she finds in her own backyard. And when we see what she sees, we begin to look in our own backyards and we begin to look at creation in a new and intentional way. She writes beautifully, and I want to read a few sentences of what she writes. She says, stop and look at the tangled rootlets of the poison ivy vine climbing the locust tree. Notice the way they twist around each other like plates in a golden braid, like tendrils of seaweed washed to shore. Stop and peer at the hummingbird nest smaller than your thumb, in the crook of the farthest reach of an oak branch. Stop and think for a time about kinship. Think for a long time about kinship. The world lies before you, a lavish garden. However hobbled by waste, however fouled by graft and tainted by deception, it will always take your breath away. Take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. As city dwellers, too often we are disconnected from the ground, and we certainly wouldn't want to take off our shoes and walk on the sidewalks. We no longer have the connection to the earth for our food and our very existence as past generations may have had. We forget that we belong to the ground and that we are interconnected to all things. I mentioned last night we had the opportunity to hear Dr. Dina Henshaw speak, and this was the point that she made, that a healthy community acknowledges its interconnectedness. When we forget that and we don't act in that way, we are no longer healthy nor resilient. It made me think of Mother Teresa's famous quote, we forget we belong to one another. And that extends to creation. We forget we belong to the earth and to all of creation. We forget that we are standing on holy ground. When my family and I first moved to Canada, the custom of taking off our shoes when entering someone's house was new to us. It was uh, uncomfortable at first, I'm not going to lie. It felt personal and intimate more than I wanted to um, experience. And, and I, it took me a while to remember to check my socks so that there were no holes in them um, before we went to someone's house. But what the custom invited us into and it taught us was to walk gently in someone's home. Taking off your shoes in ancient days was a sign of respect for the gods. <laughs> While we might not take off our shoes when we come to worship on Sunday mornings or when we walk around, the idea is that we are intentional about respecting the sacred. Taking off our shoes is a vulnerable act. It invites us to walk gently and intentionally. This is the reverence and care to which we are invited to walk all the time on the earth. And when we do this, it changes us. It changes how we make decisions and how we use the land and how we care for creation and how we build and how we use natural resources. It invites us to take a deeper look at the implication of our actions. When we approach creation with reverence and our part in this sacred interconnection, this then becomes just the way we do things. It becomes our stance, our very way of being in the world. And so as we sense the sacred in our backyard and as we walk gently, this becomes our practice and are a way to see and experience the earth as God's very own. 
As I was working on this reflection, the song that came to mind um, is in our hymnal. It is O oh Beautiful Gaia by Carolyn McDade. Gaia represents Mother Earth, and the note in our hymnal says, this song invites us to live into our care and respect for all creation and asks us to consider our relationship to the earth in the context of our faith. It is that standing before the earth without our shoes on because it is holy ground. This is a song about someone's backyard, right? All of our backyards. It's about loons and soil and waves and pine trees bending. It's what the person sees and experiences. We're going to sing this song in just a minute, and you will find, if you haven't experienced this before, that it will follow you. It's hard to get the tune out of your head. And so I'm going to invite you to take that hymn with you intentionally and to let the words of this hymn become your prayer for the week. And I'm also going to invite you to add your own lyrics to the hymn. Add the things that you notice and the pieces of creation that are inviting you into reverence. And so I'm going to suggest that we take out the book right now. I've tried to find one up here, and I don't see one, but it is in more voices. There it is right there. I don't need it, but it's the one with the spirals. And you can turn to page 41. We're not going to sing it right this second, but just look at the words. Oh, beautiful Gaia. Oh, Gaia calling us home. Oh, beautiful Gaia calling us on. Soil ye yielding its harvest. Waves crashing on granite, pine bending in windstorm, noon, er, loon nesting in marshland. And if I add my own lines from my experiences this week, I would sing, O oh, beautiful Gaia calling us home, dog barking in backyard, <laughs> robin nesting on porch, neighbor ringing the bell, Aurora dancing in the sky. Oh, Gaia calling us home. We are standing on holy ground as we sit in our backyards, as we walk on city sidewalks, as we travel on mountain trails. Take off your shoes. Walk gently. Remember the sacred interconnection. Amen. Let us, let us sing. Oh, beautiful Gaia.
You may be seated.